Uh, hi, I'm Chris. I am your host for this webinar series, CSA Revolution Series. With Compliance Group, we have a lot of really good content that we're going to present to you today. Number one, this series is for you. So I can't emphasize that enough. We want to make this as conversational, conversational as possible. Uh, so please, as you go along and you hear from, from Ken and Sento from Gilead Sciences, please do ask questions. So who is with us today? I'm going to start in the upper left-hand corner, Sento, Director of IT at Gilead Sciences. He is the quality assurance. Uh, he leads the quality assurance function at Gilead, providing independent oversight for GXP IT infrastructure, applications and platforms, and manages vendor oversight, IT inspection, and audit readiness programs. He's got over 17 years of diverse experience in biopharmaceutical business, ranging from preclinical R&D to manufacturing with leadership expertise on quality assurance, risk management, inspection, audit management, and vendor management. Sentho, welcome to today's webinar, sir. All right, next up in the lower left-hand corner of your screen is Ken Shitamato. Ken, good afternoon, sir. He leads the IT quality engineering function at Gilead Sciences, which performs software quality assurance, testing, also known as testing, validation, and infrastructure qualification. He is a multidiscipline professional with extensive experience in quality engineering, quality management, product management, and software development. Uh, he's been in the pharmaceutical space since the Stone Age. Ken, sorry to say that, since 93. <laughs> and has worked both on the manufacturing, vendor, and consulting side of the business. Ken, welcome to today's webinar, sir. Hi. And last but not least is Mr. Khaled Masali, Executive Vice President at Compliance Group. He is a thought leader in the life sciences industry and has over 25 years of experience with corporate and IT manufacturing and quality. Uh, he transitioned into consulting to bring a paradigm shift in quality and compliance by leveraging his ex experience uh, with regulatory agencies. Khaled, welcome to today's webinar series, sir. Thank you. Without further ado, Khaled, I'm now going to pass the baton to you, sir, to have a very informative and educational discussion with uh, Ken and Sentel. Thank you, Chris. Much appreciate it. And uh, of course, thank you, uh, Ken and Sentel. Uh, they're literally more than friends, they're gangs and they're team members, uh, part of the uh, FDA industry CSA team. Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what we're really trying to do today, um, uh, I'm just giving you a really short agenda here, but a little bit more objectives. Uh, the, uh, the idea of today, it's not to go through the CSA tactics or the implementation or the execution of it, right? Um, this is a series that we're planning on doing for the CSA revolution, and it is directly from the source. When I'm saying directly from the source, this is the FDA industry CSA team that has started over three and a half, four years together uh, uh, with the FDA, uh, medical device practitioners like yourself and I, and um, uh, joined uh, together with the FDA to come up with recommendation to streamline the computer system validation process. And uh, as a result of that recommendation, we recommended to the FDA if they could please put it in a draft guidance to help the industry as a whole to, to really eliminate the, uh, uh, the non-value added documentation that we all go through day in, day out. Um, uh, of course, um, we've, we've been doing a lot of these presentations. I've, been, I've done it with Ken and Sentinel and with other folks, with some of our client as well, who has implemented CSA and some haven't. Uh, CSA is not, um, is not a one size fits all, just like everything else, right? It is uh, definitely the devil in the details. Uh, we've heard so many different variation and Ken will, will, will go over some examples that he heard over. So really what we wanted out of this uh, uh, session here is to really understand what is the objective of CSA, why the CSA all started, and what is it focused on. I won't uh, spoil uh, uh, what Ken is going to talk about and Sentinel, but I'll keep it at that. So again, uh, this is a series. Uh, there will be a schedule that I will show you shortly. Um, and um, really, the, the third thing is the Gilead CSA journey, challenge, and success, okay? Uh, objective, I'll leave them for now. 
Let's talk about them a little bit later. So here is the schedule. Um, we have started, uh, as a matter of fact, and I believe in the next slide, well, we'll get to it, but not now. Um, we started this series uh, back in April 23rd with uh, Mr. Cisco Vicente from the FDA. So he's also on that FDA CSA team. So uh, our short uh, name is Fix A. And um, so keep in mind that there will be changes to our logos because I know Ken has the creative mind behind updating our logo. So he'll be changing that soon. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to give you is a list of what's happening in the next few months. Uh, we're planning on a bi-weekly series, um, a webin webinar series with various folks from Johnson Johnson, uh, uh, Fresenius, Medtronic, Boston Scientific, and more. Um, and uh, they're all really about open discussion, uh, sharing their experience. Some of them will be sharing their case studies, which I'm sure a lot of you will be more interested in. And uh, also who's been implementing it and what are the challenges that they had to go through with their quality organization, okay? Um, so uh, the, uh, the next one in July 23rd, which is really not next week, the following week, it will be with Johnson & Johnson when they will be talking about a specific case study for the manufacturing execution system, MES. So keep that in mind, keep that schedule. And I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, Chris, if you subscribe and if you register for the series, you're pretty much automatically registered for all of them. Is that correct, Chris? That, that is correct, yep. Register once and you, you have the ability to attend any or all of the sessions, yep. Awesome, awesome. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is the slide that I talked about that we had the CSA Revolution Series. We kicked it off with Mr. Vicente uh, and uh, my colleague also Stephen Cook uh, from Compliance Group. Uh, we had a really good session, lots of good questions. It's a recorded webinar. We've included the link here. Uh, also, the, if you click, of course, we will be sharing the slide with you. So when you click on the webinar material, material you'll have it. You'll also have uh, a compliance group on um, NCSA white paper, part of that. So I just wanted, also this is kind of really a housekeeping item for you to understand what this uh, webinar series is about. Now, this is the team. Um, this is the FDA uh, industry CSA team. Uh, they're folks from various medical device industry. And of course, Gilead join us from Pharma and we have other folks from Onnesil. Um, So uh, this is not a case for a medical device industry. This is a life science case here. CSA is about our industry and how we can help and I'll let Gilead speak to it from their own experience. Um, uh, there is a link here to join our LinkedIn group. Uh, uh, our team will uh, will be sharing a lot of their um, examples, a lot of their um, experience and story on that group. So please uh, join that uh, LinkedIn group to get more information. Some of the slides I'm gonna go through, they're really basically just three slides. Um, and uh, we, we've had them in various uh, uh, presentations, so I won't go through them, but everyone has experienced the cultural barriers, right? Uh, that paralyzes our industry. Uh, manufacturers are just reluctant to invest. Why? Because anytime they wanna adopt, you know, adapt uh, a, uh, a a tool, a software, uh, well, guess what? It becomes now GXP. What does GXP mean? Ho, ho, we're talking about 40% plus in budget. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to stay on paper. What is that What is that doing to us, right? Uh, slowing down innovation, just really hurting us from, from moving forward. We're 21st century. And it hurts me when I see many of the industry still worried about automating or digitizing. It's still on paper, still sign, scan, and email. There's a lot of things that you could do, analytics, AI, all of that. But we are, as an industry, we are so behind the rest of the industry, like the financial industry, for example, that also has its own regulation. Um, uh, Ken and Central, uh, please feel free to add on here because I know you've experienced a lot of these. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, Khaled, you, you, you nailed it. It's 
CSA, I mean, well, CSV is really perceived as a bourbon. It's almost like it's never ending. You want to use a tool, you end up in the part of a validation effort, you start validating that as well. And the truth of the matter is documents generally never see the light of day. Right? The documents, you, you typically the VAL plan, the VAL summary, you talk, um, it's looked at, and it's the system in production that's evaluated. So show me the audit trail for when you did, you know, lot disposition, right? When the QP went in, show me that transaction. Show me this report, generate the C of A. It doesn't go down to the screenshots, which we spend all our time doing, and that's you know the essence of where CSA is. What is what is better for patient safety, product quality? Right. Yeah, uh, exactly, Cal. I, I, it's spot on. I think uh, what is going on here, if you, if you can recollect, uh, we actually the journey of quality oversight and the interpretation of regulations that's becoming more ritualistic than the core of product quality or patient safety. So we need to bring back our focus, the product quality and patient safety by all means necessary. But all these paralyzing uh, the industry, it's not helping the product quality. It's not even helping the patient safety uh, in the better way, in the way we can help the technology. So we need to bring it back. <laughs> I like that. So that's why the revolution is for, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sounds good. It's really, uh, in a nutshell, what is computer software assurance, right? It comes from a multi-year collaboration. The folks that you that you see us here, plus 13 others that will be joining us on a bi-weekly basis. You're gonna see these folks that actually put the hard work to come up with these recommendations. Uh, it's an effort, again, between the FDA and the industry. Uh, and we're hoping uh, to have Mr. Uh, Vicente join us on some of these uh, uh, events. He will be a just a, uh, a surprise guest at one of those, but we'll see which one he will join. Um, but again, the idea was is to identify these common pain points. We've all seen them. We've all lived them. Um, and, and really, uh, there are five things that you need to know about CSA. It's risk-based on the impact of patient and product quality. And that's really what we need to focus on, okay? Again, when we're talking CSA, we're talking CSA that is not in a medical device, uh, software that is not in a medical device. So as and in, anything else, in my opinion, should fall right under this, right? And this is the recommendation based on non-product software. And uh, I know uh, Ken and Santo will give you <laughs> why they're more interested, why pharma in general are more interested in CSA more than the, uh, uh, the medical device industry. Second, it calls for the latest, uh, the least burdensome documentation approach. Again, we've been doing uh, risk-based documentation for years. The thicker the validation package, the stronger our validation package, wrong. Uh, third, it reduces paper uh, work by 80% with unscripted and ad hoc testing. Um, we did not include a lot of information here, but in the appendix, there are a little bit information on what that is, unscripted and ad hoc. What I want folks to understand, we're not saying we're eliminating testing, we're eliminating documentation. Test more, document less. Um, when you do that, it's gonna result in less issues in your production environment because you're doing a lot way ahead. And again, this is nothing new. We should be always, we all should be doing this for so many years. Unfortunately, we always fall back somewhere else and we need to document and document and we treat everything high. Finally, um, FDA and ISP EGAM have supported the CSA concept. Now supported, it's not FDA approved, it's FDA supported. We're still waiting for that FDA draft guidance to be released. However, we should not all be waiting for that draft guidance, right? Because everything we're talking about is within the current regulation. So we should start today. ISBE GAMP supported it and endorsed it 
yes, this is what Gantt has been talking about. However, it's not explicit, explicitly stated, right? Um, Ken, Santhal, and I have been uh, uh, working alongside with ISPE GAMP to, uh, to add to the GPG for data integrity by design an appendix about CSA. CSA is adapted by ISPE GAMP, and we need to keep that thing moving, right? Again, it's a paradigm shift. Um, I'm not sure if everyone has heard of John Murray. He's retired now. He's the uh, one of the gentlemen who authored the GPSV back in 1997. And basically, uh, this is his statement, benefit of detecting patient risk areas using a more flexible, less burdensome, and faster approach for data mining far exceeds the documentation time burden of current expectation. So really, the idea is, Let's move on from that the, 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 the clamps of CSV, where we're spending 80% of our time on documentation. For some folks, it's probably more or maybe less. And then really spend more that 80% on testing. So again, in a nutshell, that's what PSA is all about. But of course, uh, I'll let... Uh, Ken and Sento really elaborate and talk about um, their experience uh, with implementing CSA, the challenges they faced. But before I, all that, I would like to ask Ken and Sento, how did they join? Uh, why did they decide to join the FDA industry CSA team? So back to you, gentlemen. Start with Ken. Sure. Um... So I got involved uh, when one of my, uh, I have three quality assurance units that I work with and uh, one gentleman uh, um, approached me and said like, hey, you need to go hear what the FDA is saying. So I dropped everything, uh, crashed into a Medtronics event, I think like maybe a week before the event, pulled favors from friends at Medtronics, got through the door and uh, met everybody sat in the front row, which gave me the uh, power to raise my hand as many times as I wanted, and I could ignore everyone behind me. And they have to acknowledge me because everyone sees that my hand is up. So I made the session go long. I apologized at the end, but it really was that moment of clarity, right? When um, Cole had mentioned it, right? When you're, you're sitting there and you have, you know, John Murray, expert, you know, on software development and, and you know, Cisco sitting there saying, you know, nothing outside of the current regulation. It is a matter of clarifying misperceptions. Mis, uh, and, you know, and they said, to be honest, we never, um, we never told you that you couldn't, but then we also never told you that you could. And it was in that moment, you know, where um, questions that were asked, things, and the realization was that, industry is more conservative than the regulators. And one thing I would like to point out on the prior slide, I know it's FDA asked, but it's also A3P, right? A3P, a uh, large organization, Europe, they, they've signed up. Um, you know, we, we uh, co-wrote a letter together. The uh, India has also expressed interest, uh, you know, in the panel in India as well. And, the most interesting thing, it's a call it a to, is, is when sat there and tried to get involved because one of the things the session was, you know, volunteers, like, hey, you know, your drug, we're device. And what we did is, you know, we, anyone who knows me, I'm, I, I do a lot of fundraising, so I'm used to know. And it was just the start of the conversation. And we went and we collected data. And we kept coming back and coming back and showing the value. And one of the things I would like to say, and Colette alluded to it as well, it's, you know what? It's 100% applicable for pharma. All of our systems are non-product, right? Unless you have a combo, but let's just simplify it. Just say like for a pharma, pure pharma, pure biotech, all of our systems, right? So it's 100% applicable to us. 
all of the things that we're talking about. And there is a long history, we have a slide we'll talk about, of where CDRH is our source of information on validation. And then, um, you know, then there's a partnership brought Central in. Of course, you have to have a poly assurance unit who's, who's ready to take that next step forward and move. And we've been able to come up with models, different techniques, different assessments, which we'll talk about at a later date. This is just today's, you know, this is a kickoff of the series. We're more about the journey and how to get started and address those kind of issues as opposed to going to that. We'll come back later with some more models and other things. Santhal, anything to add? No, oh, I think uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely uh, similar type. I remember when Ken call, mentioned about that the Metronic event, uh, it just like uh, two days to go and says, I'm trying to fly out, try to join, but I could not uh, uh, clear my calendar and he went and then we synced up. And after that, we never turned back. Um, so uh, since then, the journey is completely on. Uh, it's, it's one of the fascinating thing is uh, we are in a very, uh, good point in the industry when FDA is also um, engaged with industry uh, experts. They're listening more, uh, which is which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's never heard of in the last, uh, I would say, 10, 15 years time. But uh, this is something that they are ready to listen. That's pretty much reflecting what uh, uh, John Murray mentioned, right? So um, the risk outweighs uh, um, uh, and uh, it's, not, it's not actually scalable with the way how we are operating upon. So um, since then, we are, uh, just like Ken mentioned, that we are working uh, very actively on how we can actually uh, introduce the concepts, modernize our approach, uh, both from the implementation and also from the oversight. Great, great, thank you. Um, and and, and the, really the cool thing about the combination of you two, you've got the progressive IT, right? And the progressive IT quality, right? And that's what really making things very interesting. I think this is the uh, the inference slide that I'd like you both gentlemen to really walk through it because this is an eye opener, okay? Um, and I know Ken and, and, and Santel are <laughs> pretty close to this and, and they can really uh, speak to that experience. So uh, please go for it. And uh, I don't know, Ken, if you wanna mention the little fist up there, but yes, I <laughs> The revolution, yeah. I, I mean, the, the reality <laughs> is, it's it's a modernization effort. Like all all effort, it is truly a modernization effort. I mean, if you look at the dates of the documents at the bottom, and this slide was in particular was uh, was created when we went to uh, present to Dr. Shuren at CDRH, and um, kind of bring the case for making change, right? And with a specific app, so I won't go into that right now. But so if you look at it from the first talk in 1997, every every circle here is proportional in size to the number of times it's been referenced. So clearly you see that part 11 is the largest document. And the next one at the same time was a draft, you know, um, general principle software validation. And you look that when you use a computer systems used in clinical trials, endorsed by CDR, CBER, CDRH, it points to CDRH for guidance on validation. Right? And, and that makes sense because where, where is the technology center? Right? If you look then the update, the second largest circle in 2002 is you know, the final general principles of software validation and look at the documents that reference it. Scope and application, CDR, CBER, CDRH. And so this is for the pharma folks and the biologic folks who just said, this is serious. No, it, it's not. Our guidance documents point here. Everything points here. Computer systems clinical investigations, again, points to general principles of software validation, 2007. 2017 BIMO, again, points back to GPSV. Now, the problem with that, the fundamental problem with that, that document is for product. It's got maybe a paragraph, if you consolidated a couple sentences all together for things that are non-product. And that's the fundamental issue that people are applying constraints and rules intended for product to non-product systems. And 
this is why you know taking a step back and you when you when you talk with the team and you talk to Cisco, you know they they went out, they talked to Google, you know sent the library at Google, you know they don't have testers. You look at their metrics, their metrics are very rudimentary. You look at the you can't get to training records. You're not going to see procedures and policies upgrade, you know, updated. Yet we rely on that. Even pharma relies on their infrastructure. It's not just Google; it's other organizations. It is in the moment where quality is more important than documentation. That the quality of the system is more important than all the rituals and all the screenshots and all the deviations, all the protocol generation errors because someone, you know, put a typo in a, in an expected result, and you you go off and you create this. You go talk to the banking industry, you talk to other, other sectors. The only time that they take screenshots is when there's a business value. One, to prove that a, um, an issue is a real issue or to establish a baseline. Those are the typical use cases for generating that. Whereas we haven't modernized, right? We, we essentially you look at a package now, let's just go to the end of this page, 1997. They still look the same. They still look the same, fundamentally no major difference. The rest of the world has moved forward. So, Santo, when you're in here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you see on all these regulations, everything is centered around the generally at trinity, right? Product quality, patient safety, and data integrity. But uh, back then, maybe whatever, however we have interpreted, maybe how all gone through the, in, in the manufacturing world or the lab world, it might have worked at the time based on the interpretation. But look at the way how the technologies have modernized the way how we even deliver uh, technologies to the business, right? Again, it's still geared towards patient safety, product quality, and data integrity. But we have not modernized the way how we actually implement the regulation and interpret the regulation. And more importantly on the interpretation, that means we moved away from the uh, uh, core, but more onto the documentation aspects of it. I think that is the that is absolutely key. Um, if you look at that's that's what we are seeing um, from when we go to uh, Google's of the world, or even we implement any new technologies, how we can be more uh, upfront to understand the risk involved uh, that is directly related to patient safety product quality before it can occur, or at least we can anticipate much quicker. With the current way of approaching, the, with the current way of implementing it, with the current way of oversight expectations set by the industry partly driven by the uh, historical inspection trends and also partially by the industry SMEs who have implemented over the period of time. Now we need, it's a time for us to really introspect. I think that is definitely there. It would have worked 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago uh, at the time, but we can't do the same yardstick and do the same thing with the current trend. We need to modernize our thinking. We need to modernize the way we approach quality oversight and to also enable the technologies to move forward. Again, centered around product quality and patient safety and data integrity. But then there's one, one last point here is the CSA, the beauty of CSA is it's not against the regs. Anything what we do is already in the regulation. It is not changing the way how the regulation is written. It is only allowing us to interpret in a better way, centered more towards product quality, patient safety and data integrity. So, you know, to, to, central, to, to add on that, you know, validation is one of those spaces where you know, you're really looking at it. Do you do what you say you do? And then the question is, is it enough? So you, you look at it, we're okay with if you're a smaller company that, you know, you, you, you accepted, say, compliance or UL engineering and you didn't test it. And you talk to them, multiple people do that. They don't actually do any testing. And then yet you have people will generate 20 volumes you know binders full of documentation both are compliant in the area of leveraging sqa you know that was that was my first moment when i cornered john and cisco and i asked them you know hey i have this cycle and and the response i got is like well are you are you not doing it because you don't think it works or you're not doing it because it's a compliance issue if it's a compliance issue all you need is one line in your sop that's it one line Right, to say that you're going to do it and everything before that, that those are technical issues. Those aren't compliance issues. Yeah. Right. And then that that's the difference, right? Where you're sitting there is we've over ritualized things that are technical in nature. We've over ritualized um, the taking of screenshots, which prevents us from actually applying modern approaches and seeing up. So 
to Sentinel's earlier point, it takes us so long to move that we can't keep up with cybersecurity threats. We exactly. can't keep up with updates. And you know what ends up happening is even business and other people start gaming the system to carve out requirements and intended use of systems such that, uh, you know, to avoid the effort of validation. That's what Colleg was, was showing us in the earlier slides. So we start gaming the system, which is, again, not in the best interest for product quality, patient safety, not even in interest of uh, inspection management. And then the other area where people, you know, we're, we're seeing issues with the, the adoption of CSA. People are misunderstanding CSA. They're, they're saying, oh, it's just GAMP M3. It's just risk-based table. It is nothing, right? Nothing like that at all. They're synergistic, right? GAMP is all about risk-based testing, and it's all about looking at the life cycle holistically. And if you talk to the GAMP people, one of their uh, biggest complaints is that the uh, misapplication or, or lack of critical thinking, which is one of the primary things in CSA as well. Uh, you said you need to take the critical thinking, you need to look at your approach holistically. And so you've got risk-based testing from the GAMP side. On the uh, CSA side, it is all about risk-based documentation. But the quality of the system is more important than taking a bunch of screenshots. And now for for my uh, brother, yeah, I, I've been ahead of quality as well, been there, been hosting inspections, both regulators, <laughs> uh, on a CRO, every every uh, person in the world. You know, um, when they come in, the, the reality is in the CSA model, the high risk requirements will always have more documentation, right? It's risk-based documentation. You have additional rigor the higher you go. You will capture that and you will retain that. So it goes hand in hand. And even then, what we've done, and one last soapbox comment, everyone knows it's difficult to get me to shut up when a college is leaning forward. Um, Take your time. This is your time, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I only had two panelists. I didn't want to add any more. <laughs> mm. Yeah, because cause, cause, you know, you, you know I, I'm very opinionated. So. The reality is this, this is where, where I, I see industry. We take screenshots, we create volumes and volumes of stuff because we don't want to think. We write SOPs that are wrote because we don't want to think. All right, we, we have tables, we just apply it, we don't want to think. When we go to an inspection, we just want to plop a bunch of manuals on the on the table and say like, hey, I'm not going to answer, that, that's my defense, is just throwing stacks and stacks. And, um, the reality, that's not defending, that's presenting. You know, go, go work on the service side of the, uh, you know, the industry where quality is overhead. And that's truly when you learn how to defend. True. Right? You're able to show your procedures, you're able to say, and you go to a smaller company, you have to defend, you have to have a logic and a rationale because you have finite resources. The interesting thing is the larger the company, the more conservative they become. The less likely they are to modernize because it's worked and it continues to work. But the reality is this, if you have a procedure, you demonstrate that you follow it. You know in the inspection when they're going it. So when I have someone look at a package, for example, it's like, hey, I, you don't have a test case for this. I said, I can show you that it works in production. I can show you that in my ad hoc testing that we covered it. I could pull that out of the audit trail, right? I can show you in my metrics that we capture our issues. So, so if you see, if you look at the way the trend, right, all these are geared towards the confidence on the product quality, yeah. the confidence on the patient safety. I, I remember, I think, uh, and Cisco in one of the uh, one of one of the panels, he did mention. Uh, I remember it very distinctly, right? Uh, focus on product quality, patient safety, and data integrity, and then, and then the second point is even more powerful: your your business. Take care of your business groups, right? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, they are your uh, uh, customers, right? When we deliver technology. And then the third is the one he's saying, regulations, right? Because if you follow these three, you can never go wrong, right? So mm -hmm. I, I think that's where, that's where we need to really strive towards. Uh, I think that's where the quality oversight comes into play. Are we comfortable with our uh, product quality and patient safety related areas? Do we have the necessary risk assessed? Are we comfortable taking that risk? Do you have the necessary mitigation levels? Right, um, and um, can we actually you know, do the, I think where we really need to go, we need to go towards more towards real-time monitoring, right? 
Um, these are these principles, what we have applied for CSV, it won't take us there. The technology is already there and we are not using the technology. Again, it goes back to what John Murray is saying. We cannot use the uh, technology to, the, to our advantage if we use our own yardstick and, and the benefits far outweigh the risk. Um, okay. So we can take the calculated risk, uh, mitigate it, and then move forward. That is the best way to go with it. So, you know, you're talking about risk, and really this is an opportunity to, uh, you know, how many of us have been doing the, the, the full-blown FMEA that costs hundreds of hours, right? Uh, <clears throat> I know if uh, Stephen Cook was with, with us on the call right now, he will, will tell me exactly how much the cost of an FMEA. Sometime up to $40,000 just to get an FMEA for a learning management system. Why, why are we doing that so much, right? So really the idea is focus on the patient and the product, right? Um, and, and don't spend all, all this time, uh, you know, trying to, to, to find out what else can break down. Break it, fix it. Um, so really, uh, I, I think the mentality of we, we need to change our thinking, right? We, we have to change our thinking, uh, the guidance, I can guarantee you it's not going to help so much because other folks, what might happen, they're just going to put it as is in their SOP and this is what they're going to follow and they're going to continue to do it, the same thing for every single system. There is no one size fits all. The idea is to really have that critical thinking mind. Think exactly. you know, uh, aggressively, uh, you know, what, what are the risks? Focus on that risk. So. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Ken, you wanted to say something, of course. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I, I wanted to, to talk about one, one aspect, and this, this is key. So, you know, it, it took us a year to get on the fixed team, right? I, and there was a moment, you know, we were at, uh, I was at FDA headquarters with my boss talking to Cisco, and I just looked at him and said, are we actually on the team now? And then he thought about it, and he says, like, yeah. And, and how we got there, reality, you know, the reality is we did a lot of analysis. And what I want to talk is, you know, to the people here is like, you know, have an open mind. Sunfall, you know, as my quality partner is always, you know, willing to question status quo. You know, well, why are we doing that? What is the value of that? Is there a regulation that says, and, and versus what we, we, you tend to get. So to the quality people, like, you know, like I said, I've been quality. I've been in, in your shoes. Sunfall knows that's compliance. I used to be above quality and interpreting regulations for a large pharmaceutical uh, biotech company, sorry. And um, the reality is, is you know, look at what, what is actually being said versus what we do just at a rote ritual. And if you really start looking at what, you know, and then start thinking again, as, as you know, pointed out, what adds value? But you, you got to find that partner. And for the quality people, you know, I, I want to have that open mind. When you can go from I can completely risk this, assess away a validation package to I can go and create like, you know, 30, 40 binders and both are compliant. There is a space where you can look and you can build something Absolutely. that actually works. And the, the thing that you need to do and, you know, it's called literature. You know, you, you talk to the authors like, yeah, there's a frustration that the people haven't applied it properly or you look at yeah there's you know oq and pq are only mentioned on one page in fact the first time we met with the fda and we said oq pq and they they kind of laughed at us and so you can use those words if you want that's like okay fine whatever um but it, it's this thing where you, you you need to take that be willing to take that first step like well what is the value of of what i'm doing Right? And if I were to stop, what would it what would it be? If you start thinking about what is the value, start looking at your back, how many binders actually make it into the spectrum? Right? And then the question comes in, like maybe you get that one rogue inspector who wants to do it, but that's where, you know, that's the difference between presenting and defending. You show the system under production. You pull up the audit trail. You show your metrics. There are different ways that you can address it. So the, how do you, and then you start thinking about, okay, what is gonna give me the agility that I need to help modernize. Because right now the regulators are all on board. 
In fact, when we presented this slide, we brought up one concept and the next day it was being used in the keynote address. That was our, our, our continuous yep. susceptible literature monitoring, right? We, we, we have uh, a continuous control framework where we don't even do the qualification anymore. We mm -hmm. hook it into the framework and it monitors it. And that concept was, you know, in the keynote the very next day. They are willing and listening. And so this is a moment where self-reflect partner, right? You, you just need one. And, you know, trying to go after everybody is probably, you know, like I got three. You know, if you try to get everyone on board, it's, it's a much difficult part. You, you need one to create a reference model. You need one to say, like, this is what can be done. Yeah. And then you need to start kind of going out sort of. Oh, absolutely. I think one key, one thing which I probably, you know, it may be helpful for the audience is we talk about critical thinking, right? So uh, most of the time we might, uh, we, we are already doing critical thinking to some level, uh, maybe intuitive, uh, maybe counterintuitive at some times. But one of the things which I uh, generally use, I actually read one of the Harvard Business Review article as well. Um, it's uh, uh, one of the, the three, uh, three points, very simple ones. Right? We always need to question the assumptions. Right, um, that is very powerful, and uh, and then definitely use the logic, reason through logic. And the third point, which is very very um, interesting, which is the diversification of thoughts. Right, I think uh, it's, it looks very very simple, but very powerful. Um, I've I've done it even before reading the article in YouTube to some extent, but once you start introspecting it, um, it is it is quite powerful, and we can actually apply the critical thinking um, framework kind of thing at any level if you just want to play it around. Like, I'll repeat it again. It's a question the exceptions, right? And uh, reason through logic, and then diversification of the thoughts. Make sure you speak to many people. I mean, not only just in the biopharma, it's like Ken was mentioning about banking, and Khaled also mentioned about finance. It's okay. That's why we need to really diversify the thoughts, because at the end of the day, it's again the same thing. And the quality is absolutely important, and patient safety based on data integrity as well. So um, the focus remains the same. Right, how we approach and how we apply our thinking uh, is the one that we really need to be smart and modernize our thinking as well. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and to that point, to modernize the thinking, I, you know, there's, I, you know, we, we go from validation to quality assurance is one of the typical routes. And, because, and, you know, the quality unit tends to say, like, you know, you will do it the way that I did it before. So we're stuck in this infinite loop where we, we don't break out. That's why the CSA logo is the gear that's breaking apart and being disrupted. It is an effort to modernize and technology. That, that's the meaning. It's got the C for compliance, right? It's got the C for CSA. It is a, a for us, a very powerful statement for the movement. Um, but to move forward, right, you, you need to go to see how the rest of the world actually tests are. Are you using software right now for banking, for your paycheck, for, for HR? You rely on this, right? For all of these things. And they test very, very differently. What do you care about more, your paycheck? Right? You start thinking about it as a, as a, as a core personal issue. You want that, that you want every penny. You want that accuracy, right? So you start looking at it. Go see how they test and your mind will be blown. Right? It's not about like, hey, we're talking about let's automate. They're talking about we automated too much. Right? They're yeah. talking about using artificial intelligence into into the testing. Right? They're, you know, it's a it's a completely different view. And you know, the interesting thing, I was I was talking to a quality partner one uh, recently, and he said, like, no, you know, quality, we really need a business. I said, but you're not looking at where the industry is going if we continue to do screenshots and screen captures for things that are you know essentially and if you look at general principle software validation you know if you average the all the uh, software engineering references in the appendix they average 1993 and a half right so we're based on technology and thinking from 1993 yes. that, Absolutely. that is a state of the art so you know what the world has moved forward exactly and, you know, this is where, you know, for, for the uh, quality engineering folks, whether it's Val, testing, qual, go look at how the rest of the world does stuff. <laughs> and you're, you know, it, it, it will be very eye-opening. And, and really, CSA is just a stepping stone. 
I really feel, um, well, as much as we want it to be contagious and others to really start adopting it, I feel, and again, I'm speaking from our team, uh, the FDA industry CSA team, this is just the beginning, right? Uh, we definitely want to go further because to be honest with you, this is not yet enough. You mentioned AI. How the heck are you going to validate AI, huh? The, the, have you ever yeah. thought of it? When uh, agile, agile is becoming, you know, the 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 you know the the thing today. How 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 do we do this, right? So uh, I think we ought to leave what's behind us. The regs are the regs. Our guidance out there, right? But again, um, if we tie ourselves to to this type of world, we won't be able to. Earn innovate and it ultimately save patient right so uh there's a lot of things that we could really do as an industry uh and i i don't think the regulators are gonna smack us on the head if they see us doing something as good right uh because i don't think inspectors want to come in and see stacks of papers and go through it and spend weeks there right uh specifically with the with these you know with these times everything is happening remotely now right so wouldn't you think they want a remote you know an automated system to show them any objective evidence or or show them that your production system is working so it's really around that line so um gentlemen i know we have 10 minutes and really what i wanted to do is to take some questions from the audience but before i jump to that i just want to go to that to the final slide that i know i want to remind the folks as to what we're trying to do with the with you know with these with this webinar series and uh, Ken and Central thank you guys so much because again we, by the way we were, we're going to see you again here when you're yeah. talking about your you know your the different uh, case, uh, case studies that you've actually done and saved tons and and you're actually changing the mentality around uh, in Gilead so again thank you very much. Uh, the objectives really here is do not wait for the FDA draft guidance to be released, okay? Uh, I know ISB GAMP is working on an appendix. I would not wait for that. What we're doing today is within the regulations, all right? It's a strategy. It's a concept. Document it and do it, period. Um, so start thinking how you want to implement it. Pilot studies are very effective. If you're not ready, if your organization is not ready to go and implement and change the entire IT QMS, that's fine. Do it under a pilot. And I'm sure uh, Gilead did it that way as well. Uh, digitize, please digitize uh, your current paper. Um, uh, you know, in the appendix, I've, I've included some information about how you can digitize your, uh, your validation process or your assurance block process i'm hoping by the end of the series we stop talking about the word validation and literally start introducing the assurance word right so the assurance process can be implemented not just the system i mentioned in there there's tons of other systems but again keep an open mind uh create awareness to accelerate innovation and that's really important because when we innovate you you will as an industry save lives right and again we're seeing it today look how behind we are for a vaccine for example right um yes i'm not going to blame it on automation but again if we had modernized years back i think we would have been someplace else today right um and again you, you know inspire action so you can realize the value i know gilead has I know 13 of our clients have realized the values, started on pilots, and now guess what? They're changing their entire CSV program into a CSA program because they know for non-product software, this is where it's supposed to be. Just apply CSA. So Chris, I'm gonna give it back to you. Uh, and uh, please, if you can turn the question on, I know you've got a few questions. And the first question I have is, you know, you're, you're pharma why are you involved with CDRH? Yeah, and and I think that goes back to what we had said on the, uh, the, the, the bubble slide, right? 
it, it is the center for validation, right? You look at scope and application, which was approved by CBER, CDER, right? CDRH. It it uh it points to two documents. It points to GAM, GAM four at the time, and it points to general principles of software validation for guidance on validation. So that's call it point out. Those two have already, you know, embraced CSA. We'll call it an allude to is in conversations with GAM, we're talking about well, what other documents can we write together? Right, and, and things like that. So we're already there. This is why it's a hundred percent applicable to us. And there, you know, one thing I want to point out to Colin's point, don't wait. People are already moved forward. Because when I start benchmarking, I start talking about, yeah, we already do that. You know, leverage, mm -hmm. we already do that. And I'm like, it's like, okay, so this just creates a forum where we can collaborate and move forward. That's why the LinkedIn group is great, because we can all talk and we can all share information. Excellent. All right. We do have uh, time for a couple more questions. And just as a reminder, everyone, this call is being recorded. We will send the presentation slide deck with all the links to you as well. Uh, and also, there is a survey. So when you do close out these, this application, pl please do give us uh, your insight and feedback on how, how today's webinar went as well. So we, we really do appreciate that. All right. Next question we have is, this is a tough one, reduce CSA to a single sentence. I, I got an answer. It's up to you guys. Do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it is risk-based documentation. Mm -hmm. GAMP ultimately is a risk-based lifecycle approach to you know implementing system. CSA is is really risk-based documentation. Mm -hmm. If you really look at it, that's why there's such synergy between GAMP and CSA. They go hand in hand. Now, I think that's a very important statement because uh, that is uh, that may be an interpretation. It is risk-based testing, but it is not. Mm -hmm. Please focus. I think it, it needs to be very loud and clear. Uh, more testing, but least burdensome approach, right? These two coupled together will say risk-based documentation. The focus yeah. should be largely on the product quality. Make sure that we test as much as possible, look into all aspects of it, but least burdensome approach. If you marry these two, then that sentence will come up. <laughs> and it's Pencil's right because I go to a lot, you know, I go to a lot of these events and listen. There's a lot of uh, misinformation that's being broadcast, and they're really making it as risk-based testing and not understanding. It's really risk-based documentation. And Cisco put it, you know, you know, do what you need to do. To make sure the system works. Exactly. Right? Make sure and the it's system only works. Both highs. Those highs that you need to, to create some documentation for me. But everything else is like, hey, you've got to make sure it works. You're the one who ultimately has to release the log. It has to work for you. Why do I care about a screenshot? And like ESICs, it's like, why do I care about a screenshot for an ESIC? Yeah, my, my single statement will be quality not equal to compliance. I think we focus too much on compliance and, 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 and pleasing the uh, uh, you know the inspectors or the auditors of notified body or regula regulatory agencies, but we forget about the quality of our system. How could I have perfect documentation yet my systems is full of bugs in production? So yeah. focus on quality. Two parter. All right, Ken and Sethel, here we go. CSA is a broad concept. So what's the ideal state of CSA? And then I know you touched upon this earlier. What is the relationship between CSA and GAMP? Who wants to go? <laughs> <laughs> it's for you guys. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I can go with the relationship between CSA and GAMP. So no. the GAMP generally, yeah, GAMP is, uh, is uh, they are talked about risk management and, and in many of their guidances. Uh, and GAMP actually endorsed after looking into the uh, CSA and they have written an article about it. And uh, so basically you can, CSA, the beauty of CSA is you can use any risk-based approach. Um, because the CSA provides you an opportunity to actually introspect how we can document it, irrespective of whichever risk-based uh, risk methodology you apply. If it is a GAMP-based or is non-GAMP-based, uh, anything uh, is okay. So GAMP actually sees this as a very valuable opportunity and sees this as modernizing the way they're thinking, so they endorse CSA. Um, so that is the main difference between GAMP and a relationship between the GAMP and CSA. So, so to the first part, book on um, the ideal state. The ideal state is that every every action that you do is actually adds value, that you can trace it back to patient safety protocol. 
And for me, the ideal stage is, is leveraging my SQA cycle because that's where I can bring in the most technologies, leverage over 30 years of lessons learned from the other sectors and help move the industry forward. And in that, you know, in, in the uh, good practice guide, right, we, Cisco reviewed the, you know, the appendix twice. We did specifically put a case study about leveraging. And then one of the things that we're saying, it's like, you know, it's got to add value. And the other thing is, you know, compliance comes in when it's a compliance issue. The, the quality assurance and when you start looking at GDPs and everything comes when you start building the trace matrix. So you have controls at the right places. It's consistent. Yeah. One of the fallacies that people try to do is they try to make it, well, you want to do SK, well, now it has to look like Val. Well, then you're not going to get leverage of 30 years of history from the other sectors and lessons learned. Right? And that's that, that's the, the the whole issue is like, so that good, that it's optimized, that it's value added, that it is in the best and is modernized, 30 years of history to leverage, patient safety, product quality. Product quality. So. Excellent. Also, the next webinar, uh, in the next session in this webinar series, excuse me, is two weeks from today at the exact same time. Cal, did you want to touch on that real quick with our friends at Johnson & Johnson? Sure. Um, so uh, really what's uh, important about um, the uh, uh, the July 23rd, you'll hear Johnson & Johnson speaking uh, in a different tone. It's uh, They will touch base a little bit about their journey uh, with CSA, but they're going to focus really on a case study. And I know this will be important to a lot of folks uh, to really see how it's how it's done, right? How did they do it? How do you start? How do you convince your quality organization to be on board? Um, uh, you know, it, 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 again, it's a culture, right? Um, th this is in, in everyone's benefit to do the right thing. It's not just IT acting lazy, they don't want to do documentation. No, it's not quality that they're being too tough on you. No, it's the idea. It's really this entire culture, how it can come together and, and um, produce quality product and save cost, specifically in this day and age that we live in. Awesome. Ken Senthal, thank you very much for kicking off this CSA Revolution series. We really appreciate your uh your time today. So thank you both gentlemen. No worries boss. Thank you.